Today's video is sponsored by Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel anytime. Every month they have a range of different products sure to meet the interest of everyone. With things ranging from clothing, outdoor gear, kitchen utensils, bar supplies, and so much more. 90% of their products come from small brands, many of which are based in the United States. These are high quality products too, such as the Scorch Box that includes delicious hot sauces that has become my go-to for dinner time, or the Flame Box, which is actually a portable fireplace, perfect for those romantic nights when it's too cold to be outside. And if those don't suit you or your interest enough, then don't worry. Bespoke Post has a personalized quiz that will help you find your perfect box. You can also preview your box before it's shipped. You'll get a box of awesome assigned to you, and before it's shipped, you'll get to preview what comes inside to decide if you'd either like to keep it, swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. And don't expect to be shortchanged on your order. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter cadaver at checkout or go to bespokepost.com forward slash cadaver. Once again, use the link in the description below to get 20% off your first box of awesome today. It is a sad fact of life that some human beings hold the capacity for immense cruelty. There are countless examples throughout history of people having their right to life stripped away by individuals who feel nothing for their victims. Yet this already frightening reality seems all the more terrifying and difficult to fathom when such acts of brutality are committed by the young. And there is no clearer demonstration of this than in the case of Junko Furuta and the teenagers who would decide to turn the innocent girl's bike ride home into one of the most terrifying crimes in living memory. 1988 saw 17-year-old Junko Furuta entering her final year of high school in Misato, a city in the Saitama Prefecture of Japan. Junko was a popular girl with a bright future. She was achieving high grades and worked part-time after school to save money for an upcoming graduation trip. She had recently accepted a new job where she was set to begin working after she graduated. The night of the 25th of November was a typical one for Junko. She had just finished her shift at work and planned to head straight home to catch the final episode of Tanbo, a TV show that she had been following. It was around 8.30 p.m. when she was spotted riding her bike by two boys, 18-year-old Hiroshi Miyano and 16-year-old Shinji Minato. Where Junko was a successful and high-achieving young woman, Hiroshi and Shinji were the complete opposite. Both of them, especially Hiroshi, had extensive criminal histories. Their behavior soon escalated into more violent crimes, including sexual assault. Some sources allege that Hiroshi had attended the same school as Junko, where he was known as a bully who often bragged about his connections to the Japanese Mafia, otherwise known as the Yakuza. Hiroshi dropped out of school in 1987, though it's actually rumored that he was enraged after Junko turned down his romantic advances. However, this is unclear if it actually occurred or not or if the two even knew of each other prior to the events of November 25th. Hiroshi and Shinji had been prowling the streets in search of women that they could rope and rob, crimes they would often commit. Upon spotting Junko riding home, Hiroshi told Shinji to kick her off her bike to scare her. Shinji did what he was instructed before fleeing the scene, at which point Hiroshi stepped in to play the role of a concerned onlooker. He offered to help walk her home safely, and Junko accepted. Little did she know at the time, but Junko would never return home again. 
Under the pretense of wanting to escort Junko home, Hiroshi instead led her to an abandoned warehouse. It was here where he would rape her and threaten that if she were to ever tell anyone about the assault, he would use his Yakuza connections to kill her and her family. Hiroshi would follow this up with a phone call to his three friends where he bragged about sexually assaulting Junko. One of the members of the group, 16-year-old Joe Agura, asked Hiroshi to keep Junko in captivity so the rest of the boys could have their way with her. The group consisted of Hiroshi, Shinji, Joe Agura, and a fourth boy, another 16-year-old named Yasushi Watanabe, all had a history of sexually assaulting women. In fact, they had actually just assaulted another victim that night before the attack on Junko. After the assault, Hiroshi took Junko to a nearby park where the other boys were waiting for her. Here, she was overpowered and assaulted yet again, and after, she was forced to go to Shinji's parents' house under the threat of further violence. The group had actually learned her home address from a notebook that she was carrying in her backpack, and they continued to tell her that they would send Yakuza members to murder her family if she attempted to flee. As all of this was going on and the night was growing into morning, Junko's parents grew increasingly worried, and when she failed to return home, they began searching for her naturally, before calling the police two days later on November 27th to report her missing. I've heard conflicting reports here and even people seeming to attack Junko's parents on why they waited two days to report her missing, but in their defense, I think from a parent standpoint, looking at this perspective, or even somebody who you care about, or if it's a sibling or whoever, I feel the worst possible situation that people build up in their minds is most of the time not the actual outcome. So I could see her parents actually waiting to call the police, figuring that Junko may just be a typical 17 year old and be hanging out with her friends, or she may possibly be with a boyfriend that she hasn't told her parents about doing typical late teenager type things. I mean, she wouldn't be the first 17 year old to just go missing and her parents not know where she is. So with that being said, I don't necessarily agree with people attacking the parents and blaming them on why they waited two days to report something to the police. It's a lot easier in retrospect to say you would do something in that scenario, but if you are actually in it, it's rare that you will follow what seems to be the most logical thing to do. Fearing being caught, the group actually forced Junko to call home and tell her parents that she had run away to a friend's house. She was also ordered to dissuade her parents from continuing the search. The police accepted this narrative without further investigation, and the matter was dropped. Junko's mother stated that Junko sounded breathless on the phone and later would say in an interview that Junko told her not to worry and that she would be back home soon. That would unfortunately be the last time that she would ever hear her daughter's voice. To keep his parents from reporting the group to police, Shinji actually forced Junko to act as his girlfriend when she was in their presence. Shinji had reportedly become increasingly violent towards his parents in the time leading up to Junko's abduction, and they were actually fearful of his Yakuza connections. Though they were becoming increasingly suspicious of what was occurring under their roof, neither Shinji's parents nor his brother contacted the police or tried to intervene in any way to stop what was going on to Junko, later claiming that the reason they didn't do anything was because they were scared of retaliation. Junko would spend over 40 days in captivity where she would be mercilessly and sickeningly tortured and raped hundreds of times. The group even summoned others to the home to join in on the abuse. On one of these occasions, Junko tried to escape, but she was unfortunately caught and had a pillow placed over her face before being gang once again. One of the sadistic monsters who was present during this particular attack later reported that Junko was in an almost catatonic state and that she stared blankly at the ceiling while being assaulted. The level of abuse Junko suffered at the hands of the group is far too graphic to describe in detail, and some of the things that I have read actually made me have to step away from my computer while reading it. 
what I can say is that she was sexually assaulted and sodomized with numerous objects, including scissors and, in one case, a lit match, which ended up not only maiming her, but it left her with no control of her bowel or bladder functions. Junko was also degraded and humiliated by the group. They would later go on to tell police details of how they abused her, with these acts being too numerous and too gruesome to list in the entry here. Among some of these disturbing actions, the group admitted to force-feeding her alcohol and milk in excess, beating her with golf clubs while she was hung from the ceiling, and burning various parts of her body, including her genitals and eyelids, with cigarettes and hot wax. And that is just the tame things that was done to this girl. Junko was also ordered to dance naked for the group's amusement and would be left to sleep on the balcony in the winter with no clothing. Junko would attempt escape multiple times during the weeks she was held prisoner, and on one occasion she managed to use a phone to call the police. However, the group soon called her and swiftly disconnected the line, and as punishment, the group set her legs on fire using lighter fluid. As a result of this, Junko would go into convulsions, but managed to survive this attack. The burns, unsurprisingly, did significant damage to her legs and left her unable to walk. She was confined upstairs in Shinji's house for the remainder of her captivity. By the end of December, over a month into her captivity, Junko was in a constant state of agony. She was severely disabled by the numerous beatings and burns that she had endured. She was also severely malnourished, bleeding internally, and incapable of digesting any kind of food. She could also no longer breathe through her nose due to a blood clot. The group would go on to say how often she told them to just kill her and end her suffering. And while that may sound dramatic to some, you have to realize that by this point, Junko's face was so swollen that she was completely unrecognizable. Her captors also claimed that her disfigured body gave off a rotting odor, likely due to the numerous untreated infections. Instead of having the basic human instinct to help Junko, the group instead found her to be repulsive. To regain sexual gratification for them, the group kidnapped and gangrened another 19-year-old woman whom they freed after the assault was over. This leads us to the events of January 4th, 1989. The details of what happened that day are somewhat murky. Some sources report that Junko had beaten Hiroshi at a game of Mahjong, which caused him to fly into a rage and attack her, while others say that he had been beaten at the game by an unknown third party the night before, and he took the anger he felt at the loss out on Junko. Regardless of the exact series of events, what we do know is that Hiroshi and the other boys set about savagely beating Junko. Hiroshi doused her entire body with lighter fluid and lit a match. Her entire body was set on fire and as she desperately attempted to put the fire out, she ultimately fell unconscious. The group then set about beating her with iron barbells and pouring hot wax into her eyelids. All of this was going on while Junko was still on fire. As the burns covering her body began to bleed and leak pus, the group wrapped their fist with plastic bags and continued punching her mutilated body. At one point during this vicious assault, somebody would end up kicking Junko into a nearby stereo unit, causing her to suffer convulsions. This brutal attack would last for over two hours. And ultimately, in a morbid way, me saying thankfully by this point, Junko finally succumbed to her numerous injuries. And I only say thankfully because she didn't have to endure that torture that they clearly were never going to stop. Joe Agura apparently laughed as he recounted the moment he and the others realized that Junko was dead. When I came back to the house, the girl was dead. So I lit a cigarette and put it next to her nose and the smoke didn't move at all. And that's how I knew that she was dead. The group, now registering the fact that they had just murdered their prisoner, set about disposing of Junko's body. They wrapped her bloodied corpse in blankets and stuffed her into a 55-gallon oil drum, filling it with wet cement, 
The drum was later dumped in Kodo City, a little under 80 kilometers or 50 miles away. This method of disposal led to Junko being referred to as the concrete encased girl. They claimed Junko would often mention to her captors how she regretted not being able to watch her final episode of Tombo, the show that she had been traveling home to watch the night that she was abducted. Hiroshi reportedly found a videotape of this episode following her death and entombed it alongside her body. But he didn't do this as some final feeble attempt at remorse or pity. No, instead, Hiroshi would later explain that he did this solely to prevent him being haunted by Junko's ghost. A little over two weeks after murdering Junko and dumping her remains, on the 23rd of January, 1989, Hiroshi and Agura were both arrested on separate charges. The 19-year-old girl that they had kidnapped and gang-raped in December had gone to the police to report the attack. During their investigation, police discovered women's underwear and believed that it could be related to the murder of a different woman that had occurred in November of the previous year nine days before Junko's kidnapping. While interrogating Hiroshi, police asked whether he was involved in the woman's murder. Hiroshi mistakenly believed that they were actually referring to Junko, and perhaps assuming that Agura had already folded, he began to confess to murdering Junko and dumping her body in Kodo City. Shocked by this revelation, police would find the drum containing Junko's remains the following day. She was able to be identified through her fingerprints and the DNA recovered from her body implicated several people, including the four main perpetrators. The identities of the four defendants were initially protected by the court under Japan's juvenile law as they were legally minors at the time of Junko's murder. Despite this, journalists from the area were quick to uncover and publish their names, stating that they didn't feel the boys had any right to anonymity after committing such heinous crimes, and I couldn't agree more. None of the boys would confess to the murder. Instead, they pled guilty to committing bodily injury that resulted in death. They claimed that, while they had intentionally beaten Junko, they had never intended to kill her. Given everything that I have told you prior, I have no idea how they could possibly think that. The ringleader of the group, Hiroshi, was sentenced in July of 1990. He was given the lengthiest sentence of the four boys due to his large role in the crime, receiving 17 years in prison, later upgraded to 20 years after an appeal to the Tokyo High Court. And I understand, a 20-year sentence isn't long enough, but it is the second longest sentence a person can receive in Japanese law before life imprisonment. Hiroshi walked free in 2009, though he was rearrested in January of 2013 for wire fraud. He would later be released without charge due to insufficient evidence and now repeatedly maintains a lavish lifestyle with open links to the criminal underworld. Journalists with an interest in Junko's case have attempted to track down Hiroshi in the years since, with some believing they've interacted with him under an assumed name. Those who have managed to speak to him says that he is unwilling to talk about Junko's murder. Shinji Minato, whose parents owned the home where Junko was tortured and ultimately murdered, was handed a sentence of four to six years, though this was upgraded to a five to nine year sentence. Shinji's brother, who some believe was complicit in Junko's fate, wasn't charged in connection to this case, and neither were his parents. In fact, he would move back in with his mother following his release from prison, and in 2018, at the age of 46, Shinji was rearrested for the attempted murder of a man in the same city where Junko was abducted. He was alleged to have beaten a man who was a complete stranger with a baton before slashing his throat. Shinji's defense struck a haunting chord with those familiar with Junko's case. I certainly stabbed him and beat him, but I did not intend to kill him. That certainly sounds familiar, doesn't it? The victim in this instance would actually go on to make a full recovery, and Shinji was only handed 18 months in prison with three years of probation. Joe Agura, who was 17 at the time of Junko's murder, was given eight years in a juvenile prison before being released in 1999. He would continue to boast about his role in the crime, supposedly going on to join a gang, and he would be rearrested in 2004 for assaulting a man that he thought was seeing his girlfriend. 
it's alleged that he kidnapped and beat the man for hours, telling him, I'll kill you. I have killed before. Agura served a four-year prison sentence before walking free in 2009. Yasushi Watanabe, the final member to be charged, was initially handed a three to four year prison term before, much like the others, it was upgraded to a five to seven year term. He was released from prison in 1996 and little is known about his life since. But it's been reported that he has been in no further trouble and has seemingly gone straight. This case and subsequent sentencing clearly sparked outrage throughout Japan, with many feeling that Junko's murders did not face true justice, something that many, including myself after reading this, agree with. People wondered why law enforcement failed to act, given that both Junko and her parents made numerous attempts to contact police. Considering the type of person Junko was, a popular student and hardworking employee, it was completely out of character for her to disappear from her life like this. Yet her absence was not properly investigated. In fact, it would later come to light that one of the boys Shinji had called to the home had actually contacted the police to inform them that one of his classmates was holding a girl captive. He claimed that he had been bullied into raping and torturing Junko, and he gave them the address where she was being kept. Police would dispatch two officers to the residence in mid-December, yet Shinji's parents denied that there was any girl inside. The family even invited the officers to do a thorough search, but they declined, satisfied that this invitation alone was sufficient proof that there was nothing sinister going on. In their reports, the officers noted that they conducted a preliminary search, though it's unclear what exactly this entailed, if one even occurred at all. This report to police came 20 days into Junko's captivity, and their refusal to act led to Junko being tortured for a further 20 days. Many believe that had police thoroughly investigated this lead, Junko would have been rescued. The two officers who were dispatched to the home supposedly were fired after the discovery of Junko's body, but this is unconfirmed. Shockingly, there were actually several reports from the time that depicted Junko as a delinquent who was willingly involved with all of the boys with this crime, as opposed to being the innocent victim that she truly was. Due to this and how the sentencing of the boys was handled, the Japanese public was furious that the death penalty had not been considered due to Japan's juvenile law. Many would refer to the earlier case of Norio Nagayama, who stole a pistol and actually murdered four people when he was 19 years old and legally he was considered a minor. Despite a lower court's refusal to consider capital punishment in his case, the Supreme Court would go on to order a retrial and in 1983, it was ruled that such a sentence could be considered in the cases of juveniles who had committed atrocious and callous acts. Nagayama would eventually be put to death for those crimes that he committed as a juvenile, which led people to wonder why such a consideration was not made for the perpetrators in Junko's case. Some even theorized that the Yakuza may have actually had some involvement in the boys receiving such lenient sentences, though there is no solid proof of this and this is simply conjecture. Junko's parents were understandably furious following the trials. They won a civil suit filed against Shinji's parents for failing to intervene and prevent their daughter's death while she was being held captive in their home. It's also reported that the civil court ordered Hiroshi's mother to pay the Furuta family 50 million yen in compensation, which is roughly 370,000 US dollars. She raised the money by selling the family home, though it is unclear if the Furutas ever received any money. There's also another rumor that one of the boy's mothers went on to deface Junko's grave, blaming her for ruining their son's lives, though it is unclear who committed the supposed vandalism. Junko would be laid to rest on the 2nd of April in 1989, surrounded by her loved ones. The employer Junko was about to start working for gave her parents the uniform that she would have worn, and they placed that in her casket. Junko's school principal also presented her parents with her high school diploma. Online memorials are still held actively to this day over 30 years later, and it is abundantly clear that Junko Furuta is still missed terribly by those who knew her.
The case of Junko Furuta is heartbreaking. A young woman who was so deeply cared for was stolen from those who loved her by pure evil. Though her name is now synonymous with her excruciating final months and the monsters who imposed them on her, she deserves to be remembered for who she was in life. A successful and driven young woman with big dreams and an entire future ahead of her. A future that she would tragically never get to live. just past 7 a.m. in a small region of Delhi, India, when the loud honking of a milk truck parked outside of a grocery store had begun to draw the attention of locals. The driver was attempting to contact the owners to alert them that their delivery had arrived, but was receiving no response. One resident to notice this was a neighbor of a local family who was making his way to their home to greet his friend. While usually punctual, the man's friend was nowhere to be seen, and he was instead met with a silent house and an open front door. What he would discover upon stepping inside the home would shock him and go on to be a tragedy that would forever haunt the region of Barari. By all accounts, the Chundawats were a successful middle-class Indian family. Originally from Rajasthan, the majority of the family would later relocate to Barari, where Bhavanesh, the eldest son of the family, would go on to open a grocery store. His younger brother, Lalit, operated a plywood business in the area, and neighbors reported that both ventures were doing very well. The brothers resided together in a two-story house in the Saint Najar neighborhood, with nine other family members spanning three generations. This included their mother, Narayani, their sisters, their wives, their niece, and their children, two of whom were just teenagers. They had lived in the area for decades and were well known to the neighbors, with many of them regarding the family highly. This is why the events of Sunday, July 1st, 2018, came as a shock to everyone acquainted with the Chundawats. One of their neighbors had gone to visit the residence around 7.15 in the morning, noticing that the family's grocery and plywood shops had not yet opened for the day and their deliveries had not been collected. This struck him as odd. The Chindawats were reliable people and they typically began work between 5 and 5.30 in the morning. It was standard practice for the neighbor and Lalit Chundawat to go on a morning walk together. So, as the neighbor approached the house to greet his friend, the neighbor discovered that the main door to the house was open and he simply stepped inside. The scene within the Chundawat family home was as bizarre as it was disturbing. The neighbor discovered that the main door to the house was wide open and, being that he was a friend of the entire family, he stepped inside and was met with an eerie and complete silence. No sounds of people talking amongst each other, no sounds of teenagers running around, no sounds of a TV or radio playing, just complete and utter silence. As the neighbor made his way further into the home, he quickly discovered all 11 members of the household were dead, with 10 of them being discovered hanging from an iron gate and the hallway ceiling. Nine of the ten hung in an almost circular formation. They were blindfolded, their mouths were taped, and their hands and feet were bound. Cotton wool was also found stuffed in their ears and stools laid beneath their feet. The tenth descendant to be found in this room, Lalit's wife, did not have the same bindings or blindfolds as her relatives, while Narayani, the eldest family member and matriarch of the Chandawat family, lay dead in an adjoining room, seemingly having been strangled. 
A belt and a long headscarf were both recovered from her body, where they had been wrapped, with one end being around a door handle on the other side of the room and the other being around her neck. The only member of the household to be located alive was the family's pet dog. He was found tied to a fence on the roof of the house. He was found to be running a high fever and barking repeatedly. Upon being found, the dog was immediately relocated to an animal dispensary in a nearby town to be cared for. The discovery of the bodies was extremely gruesome for all concerned. Rajiv Tomar, the first constable on the scene on that fateful day, said of the incident, It was shocking. I stayed only for about 10 to 15 seconds before rushing downstairs to call my seniors. At the time, I did not see whose hands were tied and whose eyes were covered. I just saw a lot of bodies hanging, just like branches of a tree. Eleven members of the same family were now dead under very mysterious circumstances, and the Barari police had a mammoth task ahead of them to find out exactly what had happened. At around noon, following the discovery of the bodies, police began to comb through the house for leads as to exactly what had happened to cause the death of the Chandawat family. Murder was, of course, the initial theory of many fresh on the scene, given the fact that the majority of the dead had been bound, gagged, and blindfolded, and Narayani had been apparently strangled. Police first surmised that a killer, or killers, may have massacred the family before fleeing out of the open door that the neighbor would later unfortunately stumble upon while looking for Lalit. It could also be argued that due to Narayani's advanced age of 77, she would supposedly have been easier to overpower than her younger family members and wouldn't necessarily require extensive restraints. Police also discovered a packet of milk inside of the fridge and some chana dal, a dish consisting of split chickpeas soaking in the kitchen, which they believed the family were keeping for their next meal. Cash and gold that was kept within the home was also undisturbed, and the deceased women were found to still be wearing all of their jewelry, so robbery was ruled out as a motive. It was also found that the family's phones had all been charged the day prior to their deaths, presumably by Lilith. The official investigations into the deaths would soon build steam when police encountered a series of handwritten notes kept within the Chandawat home. These notes came in the form of 11 diaries, and many of the entries mentioned finding mass salvation through a final ritual involving the same methods used in the deaths. A police commissioner on the scene was quoted as saying, We have found handwritten notes detailing how hands and legs are to be tied and are quite similar to the manner in which the bodies of the ten persons were found. It was determined that these diaries had been maintained for 11 years and held over a decade's worth of instructions, mostly written in third person. Some of these pages were released to the press. Though these 11 diaries provided a solid lead for investigators, they also threw up many questions. It was initially unclear who had written them and exactly why. Though police strongly considered these notes to be of an occult nature, ultimately though, the answers to these questions would come from an event that occurred 11 years prior to the deaths something that shook one particular member of the Chundawat family to his core. 2007 saw a different kind of tragedy befall the Chundawats when Bhopal Singh, the family's patriarch, passed away from a respiratory illness. Though it is unclear when exactly this occurred, we do know that his and Narayani's youngest son, Lalit, began to keep diaries soon after. Lalit was reportedly very close with his father and found his passing to be extremely difficult to cope with. It is believed that this is when Lalit began to engage in spiritualism. Friends and family of Lalit also stated that he had lost his voice a few years earlier following a violent attack at his workplace, only then to regain his speech after following prayers that he said were handed down from his father in a dream. Police discovered logs containing several notes with similar dreams where Lalit had expressed his belief that he was a conduit for his deceased father. 
Reports from friends and neighbors to police at the time also backed this up. Dhruv, Bhavanesh's 15-year-old son, one of the two teenagers found inside of the home, would often mention to his friends that his uncle Lalit was often possessed by his grandfather's spirit. Officials working on the case were of the opinion that Lalit had suffered from a psychotic delusion which manifested itself into an intense spiritual belief that he was possessed by his late father. Handwriting analysis performed on the diaries determined that they had been written by Lalit's niece, Priyanka, and dictated by Lalit, who believed he was passing on instructions to the family from the former patriarch. One entry from May of 2013 reads, Take care of your mistakes. Don't feel bad about the mistakes that you have made. Accept them and move on. Resolve financial and mental problems together. As mentioned earlier, many of these entries also outline the exact method of death that each family member endured. Right down to Narayani, where it was written that Bibi, or grandmother, was permitted to lie down in the other room to perform the ritual as she was too frail to stand on a stool. Another entry from these letters includes, One person should do the work of tying the knot, hands apart and mouth apart. There should be nine people on the grate, the baby should be on a separate stool, and mother should be on a separate table. The baby that is being referred to was actually Lalit and Bhavanesh's younger sister, Pratiba. There are also references in the diaries to a ritual where a person or persons form the shape of a banyan tree, a greatly respected tree in India with long hanging branches. The notes assert that performing this ritual would make God happy. Dates and times were also specified, with one entry dating back to October 21st, 2013, which mentions there being five years remaining. Another note that was made mentioned of the hour before midnight and 1 a.m. An autopsy that was performed on the family determined that the time of death to be at approximately 1 a.m. One officer later spoke of these notes, saying, Almost every step mentioned in these notes seem to have been religiously followed by the family. Police ultimately ruled out foul play and concluded that the deaths were a mass suicide brought on by a shared psychosis, likely stemming from Lalit. CCTV footage from an opposite home also captured the family gathering items like stools and electrical wire in the hours before their passing. These items would later be discovered with their bodies, along with the evidence of their final meal, which the family had had delivered. The tapes also failed to show any outsider entering the property on the night in question. One of the saddest aspects of this case is that the family likely did not expect to die. Some of the diary entries include instructions for after the ritual was performed, including who will untie who, and the writing suggested that the family or at the very least, Lalit believed that his father's spirit would return to save them from death. The final entry from the diary was made just days before the tragedy. Father has said that we would feel a jerk at the last minute. The sky would shake, the earth would shiver, but do not be scared. Chant louder, I will save you. Help each other to climb down, you will not die. In fact, you will have to achieve something bigger. A psychological autopsy reported that there was an absence of intention to commit suicide. Despite the police ruling out the possibility of foul play, many unanswered questions continue to surround the case. The mass side theory's most vocal critic was Dinesh Singh, the surviving brother of Lalit and Bhavanesh. Dinesh had not relocated to Barari with the rest of the family and was living in Rajasthan at the time of their deaths. He firmly believes that his loved ones did not commit suicide, but instead were murdered. He and his sister, who spoke to Lalit the day prior to the deaths, reject the official police findings. They state that they had no knowledge of their brother's intense spiritual connection with their late father, and instead believe that there is some kind of conspiracy going on. Dinesh asserts that the investigation was insufficient, stating, We are not satisfied with what the police are saying, that they died while carrying out the ritual, but how much do I fight? 
I am alone in this battle and the police do not have any answers to my questions. Dinesh also points out to a few factors which do not support the suicide theory. He refuted the finding that his mother, Nayarani, had perished due to a partial hanging from a wardrobe door handle, claiming that it would have been too weak to support anyone's weight. He also questions how it would be possible that Lalit and his wife, Tina's hands, were bound and believes that if they were the ones responsible for tying the others up, their hands should be open and untied. Not only that, but Dinesh's niece, Priyanka, who was among the dead, had gotten engaged merely days before her passing, and Dinesh maintains that she was excited for her wedding the following year. He wept as he explained to journalists, We were so happy and excited about Priyanka's wedding. We were all eagerly waiting and making plans. Skeptics of the mass suicide theory also refer to the lack of any suicide note as being bizarre. Some contend that this was a murder-suicide, believing that Lalit and possibly Tina killed their relatives before staging them in a banyan tree formation and then ending their own lives. Those against the police's theory of mass psychosis argue that two seemingly aware 15-year-olds would not have willingly committed suicide purely due to their uncle's instructions. Some sources also report that the children's feet were actually touching the ground when their bodies were discovered hanging, though this was unconfirmed by police. Others note the consistency of the number 11 throughout this case. There were 11 bodies that had been found, with 11 diaries maintained over the span of 11 years. The Chundawat family had recently had some piping installed in their home, and the photos of the crime scene that were later circulated online showed 11 pipes protruding from the walls of the house, which some believe is no coincidence. Dinesh denies that this has any connection to the case, however, explaining that they were purely there for ventilation purposes and that it had been his idea to have them installed. Another avenue that police did explore was whether or not the family had been brainwashed and lured into a mass suicide by a spiritualist named Gada Baba. Police would later reveal that while they believed the family, and in particular Lalit, had been following Gada Baba, he was ruled out of having any involvement in their deaths. The mysterious nature of the Chandawat deaths has compounded the grief for the few surviving relatives. Dinesh's daughter describes the grief of losing five of her cousins, saying, We used to chat almost on a daily basis, and sometimes I feel an urge to call them but there is no one now. That void will never be filled. Regardless of whether you believe that the Chundawat family was murdered by an unknown entity or suffered a shared psychosis, their deaths are unimaginably tragic. All we can say for certain is that in one night, 11 members spanning three generations of the same family lost their lives. Their passing leaves a great hole in the lives of those who knew them, particularly for their remaining family, who will have to carry on without ever truly understanding why such a tragedy came to haunt them. At 8.15 p.m. on the evening of February 9th, 1994, a 31-year-old woman named Gloria Cecilia Ramirez was rushed into the emergency department of Riverside General Hospital in Riverside, California. She was suffering from heart palpitations and her breathing was irregular. Gloria was in the end stage of terminal cervical cancer, so problems with her heart and breathing would not be unusual. What happened next, however, was... As the staff of Riverside General raced to stabilize Gloria, several of them began to feel sick. They noticed a strange smell coming from Gloria's body and mysterious particles floating in her blood. A nurse fainted, followed by a medical resident and then a respiratory therapist. The hospital staff evacuated all of the emergency patients except Gloria to the parking lot. 
Only a skeleton crew remained behind, fighting to save her life. It was unfortunately a battle that they would lose. At 8.50 p.m., Gloria Cecilia Ramirez was pronounced dead. She left behind two children, ages 9 and 12. The events surrounding her death made 23 people sick and sent five of them to the hospital, one of them being in intensive care for two weeks. Gloria's autopsy would be conducted by pathologists wearing protective suits and gas masks, and in the wake of that February night, there would be one question on everyone's mind. What happened to Gloria Ramirez? There unfortunately isn't a lot of information about her online other than her death. She died young when the internet was in its infancy, and the bizarre way that she died overshadowed everything else about her. When the Los Angeles Times covered her funeral, it described her as living in relative obscurity, right before reminding everyone in the same sentence about her dramatic death. It seems that the only part of Gloria's life the world finds interesting is how it ended. The things that we do know about Gloria was that she was married at one point and that marriage ended. Some sources say that she was living with a second husband at the time of her death. We know that she had two children from a previous marriage, a 12-year-old girl and a 9-year-old boy, both of whom lived with her. We know that she had a sister, Maggie, who escorted those children to Gloria's funeral and spoke to reporters on behalf of the family. By all accounts, Gloria was friendly and quick with a joke, the kind of person who had a smile for everyone she met. Gloria Ramirez was someone people would miss. She was one of the least toxic people you'd ever meet. It was ironic then that she'd become known to the world as the toxic lady. Going back to the night that she died, on the evening of February 19th, an ambulance rushed Gloria to Riverside General. She had been complaining of severe chest pains, vomiting, and shortness of breath. She was confused and in pain. Although she had been diagnosed with terminal cancer, she was expected to live at least a couple more years. In the ambulance, paramedics hooked Gloria up to a ventilator and started an IV. By the time she was wheeled into the hospital, she'd gotten worse. She was barely conscious and her speech was slurred. She didn't seem to know where she was or what was going on. Her heart was hammering rapidly and she was struggling to breathe. The medical staff injected her with sedatives, including Valium and Ativan. When she didn't respond to the injections, they pulled out the defibrillator. Susan Kane, a registered nurse, noticed an oily sheen on Gloria's skin. Other nurses and doctors noticed it too, and they reported smelling a almost fruity garlic-like odor on Gloria's breath. Kane picked up a syringe to draw a blood sample, but when the needle slid into Gloria's skin, Kane was hit with a powerful smell of ammonia. If you've ever sprayed a bottle of Windex, you know the smell I'm talking about. Since human bodies are not supposed to smell like window cleaner on the inside, Kane passed the syringe to Dr. Maureen Welch, a respiratory therapist, who took a sniff and agreed. Welch passed the syringe to Julia Gorjinski, a medical resident, who looked closely at the collection tube and noticed tiny manila-colored crystals floating in the freshly drawn blood. And that's when Kane fainted. Kane was taken out of the room as the rest of the team kept trying to shock Gloria's heart into beating normally. Then Gorjinski complained that she felt nauseous. She left the trauma room and sat down at a nurse's desk to recover. A staff member asked her if she was okay, but before she could answer, she passed out. Shortly thereafter, Welch passed out too. That was the last straw for Riverside General. Orders came down to evacuate the emergency room. Patients and staff were hustled out into the parking lot on a very chilly night, except for a handful of people who were still working to save Gloria. 35 minutes after she entered the ER, Gloria was declared dead. Her body was placed in an aluminum container and she was removed from the hospital. TV news crews arrived at about the same time as the Riverside County Hazardous Materials team, and the story of the mysterious woman knocking people out with her fumes immediately began to spread. And then, Gloria was dubbed the Toxic Lady. But despite the panic sweeping Southern California, the hazmat team searching the emergency room didn't find anything out of the ordinary. 
They searched for every toxic substance they knew how to test for, and they came up empty. There was nothing in the ER that could have knocked out three people and sickened many more, leading many to think that it must be something about Gloria. Ten days later, pathologists with the Riverside County Coroner's Office donned protective suits, strapped on respirators, and entered a specially sealed room to autopsy Gloria's body. There, they sampled everything that they could. Her blood, her tissue, even the air from the body bag that she had arrived in. And they found nothing. What they did find on Gloria was advanced cervical cancer and the kidney failure that had ultimately killed her. However, patients with cervical cancer and kidney failure do not usually knock out medical staff with their body odor. But something had happened. Julia Grzynski was still in intensive care. Her symptoms included difficulty breathing, inflammation of her liver, and pancreas, and necrosis in the bone marrow in her legs that left her unable to walk and would require at least three different surgeries. Other people in the ER that night reported a laundry list of ailments. Dizziness, fainting, burning sensations on their skin, nausea, trouble breathing, tremors, and even paralysis. What could do all of that to 23 people without leaving a trace? Riverside County authorities were very slow to release information to the public. Two months after Gloria died, her family demanded an independent autopsy. Dr. Richard Fukumoto performed this second examination, or rather, he tried to. The body had been kept in terrible conditions and it was extremely decomposed. On top of everything else, Gloria's heart was missing. Dr. Fukumoto didn't find anything that would explain the events of what happened on that fateful night. And unfortunately, with the lack of any solid conclusion, theories were bound to come. Three theories were proposed for what happened to Gloria. The first was that Gloria swallowed some kind of poison, potentially a pesticide, in an attempt to end her life. Many pesticides contain a dangerous chemical called organophosphate that could have caused some of the symptoms in the hospital staff. But there are several problems with this theory. For one thing, Gloria's family insisted she was not suicidal. And while they are not exactly neutral observers, it's worth noting that no evidence organophosphate was found in her home. And while pesticides could have caused some of the symptoms reported by the hospital staff, most of those symptoms show up in people who actually swallow the chemicals. So unless people in the emergency room were somehow drinking fluids that came out of Gloria's body, the pesticide theory doesn't add up. The second theory was the one proposed by California's Department of Health and Human Services. The department sent Dr. Anna Marie Osario and Kristen Waller to the hospital to give out surveys and interview people who'd been there that night. The two investigators found that everyone's blood samples were normal, and that they also noticed that the majority of hospital staff who reported symptoms were women, including all three people who passed out. In September of 1994, the state released a report claiming that Gloria had died of cervical cancer and nothing else, and that the hospital staff's symptoms were all caused by mass sociogenic illness, or as it's otherwise known, mass hysteria. However, the staff of Riverside General didn't see it that way and actually took it as an insult to their profession. Susan Kane, the nurse who was first to lose consciousness, said, I've worked in an emergency room for seven years and I've never had anything like this happen. Julie Grzynski filed a $6 million lawsuit against the hospital, claiming the investigation had been botched and pointing out that mass hysteria was the culprit didn't explain what happened to her. Being afraid or panicked, which is what this can be boiled down to, can include symptoms that were exhibited by people at the hospital such as intense discomfort, an upset stomach, feeling nauseous, having a headache. However, being afraid and panicked doesn't typically cause bone marrow to rot. So the theory of it being mass hysteria for a lot of people, including myself, doesn't add up. The third theory may be the most compelling. It comes from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. The Livermore team was invited to look at the autopsy and the toxicology reports. 
They found a lot in Gloria's system that would be expected, including painkillers like acetaminophen, lidocaine, and codeine. All normal things for someone with end-stage cancer. But one chemical surprised them. A compound called dimethyl sulfone, or DMSO2. The compound showed up in the air above the blood in the collection tube, and it's known to form crystals at room temperature. If Gloria had DMSO2 in her blood when it was drawn, it could have formed the crystals that Gorjinsky saw. But the question then was how did DMSO2 get into Gloria's blood? Without getting too far into the chemistry of all this, because I confused myself when researching it, the easiest way for DMSO2 to get into someone's blood is for them to ingest a parent compound called dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO. Now, DMSO is primarily used as an industrial degreaser, but it has some medical uses, mostly because it is unusually good at getting through human skin without damaging it, so it is sometimes used to deliver medications. Gloria, however, didn't have any medical conditions that would cause her doctor to prescribe her a treatment that used DMSO. In the 1980s, DMSO was promoted as an alternative cancer treatment. Because of this, it quickly became a home remedy to deal with cancer pain, even though the FDA referred to it as more having a placebo effect than actually doing anything. People would rub DMSO gel on their skin to alleviate pain. However, the gel would leave a very oily residence and it smelled a lot like garlic exactly what was described with Gloria. But the problems that arise from this is that fumes from DMSO gel don't exactly knock out people from their scent. As I mentioned earlier, Gloria's official cause of death was labeled as kidney failure, which is not a quick process. Her failing kidneys could have caused a urinary blockage, making it possible for the DMSO on her body to build up instead of filtering out through her urine. That could explain the sheen that was seen on her skin and the smell on her breath. When the paramedics gave her oxygen in the ambulance, that could have combined with the DMSO in her blood to form DMSO2, which would explain the crystals. And remember that defibrillator that was used to shock Gloria's heart? The Livermore team claimed that the electric shocks converted some of the DMSO2 into dimethyl sulfate, and that is called DMSO4. And DMSO4 is very, very nasty stuff. I'm going to summarize this even more than DMSO2 because I'm already confusing myself with this amount of chemistry. I will summarize DMSO4 by saying that it is so poisonous and so corrosive to human lungs that it was actually investigated as a possible nerve gas during the First World War. It causes cancer and genetic mutations. Unlike the other chemicals we've talked about, DMSO4 doesn't have a strong smell, but even at low concentrations, it can make people sick. At high concentrations, it can kill. Of the three theories, the Livermore explanation seems to be the strongest. In fact, for some people, it is an answer to what happened to Gloria. It's actually even starting to make its way into textbooks for forensic science, but no explanation about it is perfect. There are, of course, others who were there or who have heard this story who do not agree with that theory, Gloria's family being one of them. They insist that she did not use DMSO and it wasn't found in her home. While again, DMSO is a popular alternative treatment for cancer pain, there haven't been any other cases similar to the toxic lady in nearly 30 years since Gloria died. Ultimately, all we have is a guess. And unfortunately, a guess isn't good enough. We'll probably never know exactly what happened in that emergency room of Riverside General that night. There are no more samples to test, and Gloria has been laid to rest. All we have now are guesses and theories. I have considered using the story in the past, but always turned away from it due to the amount of chemistry involved and having such a heavy medical background. I didn't think I would be able to correctly discuss all of the information, and even now I have no idea if I did the story justice. 
What I did want to do is bring more attention to this case simply because this poor woman is more widely known as an offensive nickname like the toxic lady rather than who she was, Gloria Cecilia Ramirez. A loving mother, sister, daughter, and friend. Someone who was fighting a losing battle, yet still managed to bring a smile to people's faces.